It was the day that shook the world. September 11, 2001. The date that will forever be known as 9-11. Now, we have several situations that go going on here. It's uh, escalating big, big time. On that day, 19 men armed only with box cutters hijacked four fully fueled passenger jets and attacked America in its very heartland. The world changed in a couple of hours in a very profound way. A 737 hit the World Trade Center. By the time that terrible morning was over, nearly 3,000 people were dead. And one word summed up our future. Terror. I am watching thousands of people dying right now. 20 years on, we identified the lessons learned that day and how we failed to heed them. Didn't really resolve a lot of the problems in the Middle East. The war on terror removed figurehead Osama bin Laden, but the ultimate goal to destroy terrorism is further away than ever. And with the resurgent Taliban now ruling Afghanistan, the world may be at greater risk than when we started. They want to make us afraid of one another. Tonight, we'll investigate what went wrong and reveal what experts fear is yet to come. The Americans know that if terrorists ever get their hands on a nuclear device, they will be the target. As we return to the very moment, the world changed. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me, James Dorney, who was then a 25-year-old management consultant working on the 92nd floor of the South Tower and who miraculously survived to tell us his extraordinary tale. Former Australian Prime Minister John Howard, who was in America and sheltered with his family in a Washington bunker as the Pentagon came under attack. Professor Simon Jackman, CEO of the United States Study Centre at Sydney University, who was working in America when the attacks occurred. In Brisbane, Yolanda Jetton, Professor of Psychology at Queensland University and an expert in trauma. And from Canberra, Dr Anne Alley, a counter-terrorism expert and Australia's first female Muslim member of federal parliament. Thank you very much for joining me. For those of us alive at the time, we all remember where we were on 9-11. It was late night in Australia. Those of us with the television on would have seen the news break around 10 p.m. Welcome to this special edition, extended edition of National 9 News, as we try to come to terms with the almost unbelievable events. An aircraft had just struck the World Trade Center its 110-storey twin towers, highly visible symbols of American financial dominance. Surely an accident, we thought. They just think there's going to be another explosion. But no, it was the first direct act of war against the United States in over 50 years. America was under attack, but by whom? The terrorist group Al-Qaeda and its leader Osama bin Laden were generally unknown to the public and fatally underestimated by intelligence services in the West. That is until 8.46 a.m. when American Airlines Flight 11, a Boeing 767 with 92 passengers and crew on board, struck the World Trade Center's North Tower. James Dorney had been working in New York for nearly three years and was at his desk on the 92nd floor of the South Tower. Uh, James, you were in the thick of it. That's right, Liz. My office was looking north and I remember I got off the phone and I was looking straight at the building in front of me when it essentially exploded. So it happened right in front of my eyes. Basically, 
10 floors exploding straight in front of me. And you had no idea at that point what that was? I never actually saw an aircraft, but an almighty explosion. <laughs> the smoke, the flames. slips of paper floating on the breeze. I assumed that a pipe had exploded. That's all I could come up with. But at that particular time, uh, it was just mayhem. To quell the panic, an announcement instructed James and his colleagues who'd seen what had happened next door to stay at their desks. I was, I think, in a, a state of shock and wandering around on the 92nd floor when that particular announcement was made that the South Tower was secure and that you could stay put. For some reason, it had the exact opposite impact on me. And I thought, you can tell me that when my feet are on the ground, I'm out of here. And I got into a fire escape in the uh, northwestern fire escape in the South Tower, which turned out to be the furthest stairwell from where the plane was about to crash into the building. At 9.03 a.m., scarcely 20 minutes after the North Tower was hit, United Airlines Flight 175, another Boeing 767 carrying 65 men, women and children, crashed into the South Tower between the 77th and 85th floors. I wasn't too many floors down. I soon recall I was at around the 70th floor when the next plane came crashing into the building. So I was stuck in a very narrow stairwell when that occurred, probably just a little bit below the point of impact. But did you know that that was a plane? No, no idea. I, I didn't know for a long, long time what had happened. It looks like a movie. I saw a large plane, like a jet, go immediately headed directly into the World Trade Center. You have a Boeing 767 crashing into a building. It's very difficult to put into words the force that I felt. I had to catch myself. I, I thought I was dead. Then it turned out that I wasn't, and the building stopped shaking. And I said, I better keep going down here. Something else just hit a very large plane. At that point, people started to fill into these stairways. I really remember the piles of shoes being left at, at every turn, people kicking off their shoes. And I remember standing still in the 50s because there were then that many people in the stairs and you couldn't move. And I remember thinking to myself, I just can't get out. Those stairs were the worst, the absolute worst. It really uh, brings back some, some, some pretty horrific memories when I think about it. It was the worst because uh, every, everybody was trying to do what you were doing. Well, you couldn't really help yourself and it's probably very lucky that I didn't know what had happened, to be honest, because that really would have set people off, I think. There were people sitting down on the stairs waiting to be rescued. And you, I, I just had to get out. Uh, I had to get out of there. Even while James Dorney and thousands of others trapped in the Twin Towers were still fighting for their lives, the terrible truth of the attack was sinking in. In Florida, President George Bush was visiting a class of second graders when his chief of staff interrupted. Bush was told of the attacks as TV cameras rolled. I walked up to him and leaned over and said, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. And I think that's the day he really recognized the great burden of being president. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. And freedom will be defended. 9-11 was new territory for everyone. Nothing like it had ever happened in military history, and the world had to quickly come to terms with a horrifying new reality. 
Yolanda, from your perspective, this is the beginning of the trauma. From the moment we saw what was happening, the trauma began. I guess what it actually did is that the world changed in, in, in a couple of hours in a very profound way. And I guess it really left us with the sense of what's next or who are we going to become. At that stage, I don't think any of us knew really what the magnitude of it was or what it really would mean for the future. And Ali, you were in Australia. And like many Australians, I was watching television and this came on the screens. We were all witnesses to this tragic event unfolding live before our eyes. We were all placed in the position of witness. Simon, where were you? It was early morning in California. Our next door neighbour came pounding on our front door saying they've blown up New York. I've been in those buildings myself. You know how many thousands of people work there. And you're just thinking to yourself, I am watching thousands of people are dying right now live TV. It was only 9.30 in the morning, but already hundreds of innocent people were dead and the financial district of New York had become the first field of battle in a terrifying new war. In the US Capitol, 9-11's next act unfolded. Mike and Andrea, can you hear me? First of all, let me just first describe the scene. This is the west side of the Pentagon, the heliport side off of Washington Boulevard. At 9.37 a.m. Washington time, the shock and scale of the Al-Qaeda attack intensified. American Airlines Flight 77 plummeted into the Pentagon, piercing the heart of the US military. It was Osama bin Laden's ultimate humiliation of this superpower. All 64 people on board and 125 inside the building died. Folks, we gotta leave. Chaos gripped the capital. Turn around and walk. 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 The White House was evacuated, then the Capitol building. And in the midst of this escalating national crisis was our Prime Minister, John Howard. Can I just say now? Horrified I am at what I've just heard regarding uh, what's happened in New York. It appears to be a most horrific, awful event that will obviously entail a, a very big loss of life. John Howard joins us now from lockdown in his Sydney home. You would remember that quite vividly, I would think, Mr Howard. It was during that news conference that third plane slammed into the Pentagon. I went back to my room and within minutes, George Edwards, who was the head of my security, American security details, said, you're getting out of here. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I haven't lost anybody yet and I don't intend to start today. This rarely seen footage captures the tense moments in which Mr Howard was rushed to safety at the Australian Embassy, while authorities desperately tried to track down his wife and son. And I wanted to know about my wife and elder son, Tim. He and, and his mother were heading, in fact, towards Pentagon because they're going on a bit of a sightseeing visit. When they heard about what had happened, uh, that changed very rapidly. And they were directed to the, to the bunker underneath the uh, Australian Embassy in Pennsylvania Avenue. As the Howard sheltered in the bunker, outside the US military was in disarray its leaders in hiding, the Pentagon in flames. Well, it's not just a symbol. It's far more than a symbol. It's, it's the central nervous system of the American military, where the Secretary of Defense works, the very top of the military leadership, the Joint Chiefs. The idea that that could be hit in the way it was and taken offline, um, uh, for a time at least, just a remarkable thing for people with box cutters um, to be able to pull off. 
Uh, Mr Howard, uh, this wasn't just any old building, was it? They'd struck the two great American symbols. The Twin Towers were a symbol of economic supremacy and the Pentagon was a symbol of military supremacy. It had all the symbolism, it had all the audacity. It's always difficult to say this without being misunderstood, but as a calculation designed to humiliate, it couldn't have been better as far as the terrorists were concerned. And quite extraordinary, really. You have this idea that America is absolutely invincible. No country is invincible. Meanwhile, James Dorney was out of the South Tower, but he was not out of trouble. I vividly remember coming to the bottom of the World Trade Tower there, looking out through the glass. The sky was black. There was debris falling. I thought to myself, what is going on here? Running up the other way were all the fireys. They were knocking themselves out to get up into that building and rescue people and fight that fire. All I could think of was going the other way. These amazing people were going into the building. I can't imagine uh, what you thought was happening to you. I didn't know. We came out a block away when we finally emerged onto street level, and I remember that there were fully grown men screaming and wailing. It was a complete war scene. There was screaming, there was sirens, there was horrific scenes all over the street of body parts. I looked up, people jumping out of the towers. like a scene out of hell, basically. And I remember getting about a block away up onto Broadway and finally looking up over my shoulder and seeing essentially two burning towers. And I thought to myself, I need to put that much distance between me and them. And I took off uptown and it's just as well I did because I hadn't been out very long when the South Tower fell down. On a morning that was already far beyond the bounds of comprehension came the truly unimaginable. At 9.59 a.m., less than an hour after it had been attacked, the earth shook around the World Trade Center. The South Tower collapsed, the immense structure disintegrating in less than 10 seconds. At 10.28, less than 30 minutes after the South Tower falls, the North Tower collapses as well. Oh my God! Oh my God! In that moment, the Twin Towers cease to exist. <laughs> James Dorney, that is obviously a moment that you can't forget. No, look, I'll never be able to forget that. Yeah, mate! Mate! We were traumatised watching it. When you hear what James went through, it's unimaginable. Yeah, look, I, I think what James experienced is indeed a very deep personal trauma and it is clearly life-changing. And at the same time, I also think that there's... It's clear that this is a trauma and it's a collective trauma. It resonates, doesn't it, in all of us. There is a little bit of that traumatic day in all of us. That's right. It represented American identity, you could say. And when that is possible, when you actually see on your screen that it's possible to destroy that in such a way, that goes quite deep, not just at a very personal level, but also at a very collective level. It affects societies and, and everyone in it. Mr. Howe, did you think at that moment that the world has just changed now? I mean, look, I don't pretend to have uh, foreseen how it was going to change, but I knew that this was a life-changing event. It was an even more brutal assault, audacious assault on American sovereignty than Pearl Harbor. 
I immediately thought, well, you know, this has clear government and political consequences. Obviously, the initial response uh, had to be from the United States. But overall, um, I, you, know, you do start to think fairly quickly of, of how you should respond. There is not anything recognizable of what were the two trade towers. Nothing. The aircraft crashed right through to the central courtyard, killing all 64 on board. Yeah, we're looking at it in these pictures here, which are just horrific. This looks like downtown Beirut a few years ago. With the destruction of the World Trade Center, nearly 3,000 people are killed. Only 16 survivors will ever be rescued from the rubble. In the days that followed, Americans lived in constant fear of further attacks. Australia's intelligence chief at the time, ASIO boss Dennis Richardson, says this attack was a failure of the US and its allies to imagine the scale, effectiveness and ingenuity of their enemy. If you had have asked me to write down the 50 most likely terrorist challenges that we might have in 2001, I wouldn't have written that down. We were so focused offshore we were so focused on where our vulnerabilities might be globally that we forgot our own vulnerabilities domestically. The bottom line was that it was a failure of imagination. We all lacked imagination. The intelligence world quickly focused on the little-known terrorist group Al-Qaeda and its shadowy mastermind Osama bin Laden, who operated from a stronghold in Afghanistan. This was an entirely new breed of enemy, one with no rules of engagement and whose weapon of choice was fear. The images that were broadcast on our televisions kept it in the collective memory. Part of terrorism is that surprise element, it's that media coverage, it's capturing the international imagination. Yes, it was very calculated. It was very calculated move. It is also the unimaginable of using something that is part of our everyday, an airplane, to conduct such a heinous terrorist attack. If I could bring in Yolanda here, seeing those towers crumble, the Pentagon's been hit, the psyche of the world has shifted, hasn't it? The symbolic humiliation that this attack represented should not be underestimated in the sense that it sort of it is an attack in the heart of a country that thought it was invincible, that this would never happen on American soil. And so in that sense, it is indeed something that is a very deep wound, collectively, you could say. James, you lived this, you breathed this, you survived this. Just. Did you get angry or did you just think, thank God I got out? I never really felt any anger about it, Liz. My overwhelming sense throughout all of this was one of sadness. And I just remember this eerie feeling in New York of shock on people's faces. It was like the oxygen had been sucked out of New York and that was not probably unique to New York. I think all around the world, people were either waking up or going to bed thinking, what's happened here? And what's it going to mean? The American homeland had been attacked as never before. The shock and the casualties far greater than the Japanese surprise bombing of Pearl Harbor, which propelled the US into World War II. Americans wanted revenge. And their president, George W. Bush, who'd been elected by the barest of margins less than a year before, suddenly became a wartime leader. I can hear you! I knew that the Americans would respond uh, and instinctively thought to myself, well, we'll have to be alongside them. 
I did go to Congress that day on Wednesday, and I, it was probably one of the most emotional moments I've had. Uh, I had as Prime Minister. The chair wishes to acknowledge the presence of the Prime Minister. And then that afternoon, I said that we would stand beside the Americans in any response. I hadn't discussed that with my cabinet or um, but, but I knew instinctively that was what the feelings of the great majority, not everybody, the great majority of the Australian people would be. You can be assured of Australia's resolute solidarity with the American people. True to his word, when America invaded Afghanistan on the hunt for Osama bin Laden a month after 9-11, John Howard ensured we were there. And you have no regrets about that, Mr Howard? No, no, I had no regrets about that at all. There was an almost united view in Australia that we should join in the initial intervention to deny al-Qaeda the safe harbour of Afghanistan to mount a future attack because one of the immediate reactions of people was this could be the beginning of a series of attacks around the world. Was there any other option other than war? That there was no way the United States could stand for this. There's a sense from the American security establishment we couldn't protect our people. They had to fend for themselves on that day. So damn right, they were going to go after someone. We know where they are. Now, how are we going to go get them? Well, given he was so pivotal to this whole group, and Ali, would it have been better just to go for Osama bin Laden? Military strategists rightly pointed out that the mistake was utilising conventional warfare against an unconventional enemy. You may have uh, used military might to uh, destroy terrorist training camps, but it certainly did not kill terrorism. But 9-11 gave President Bush virtual carte blanche to strike anywhere at will under the banner of the war on terror. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped and defeated. But there was one country and one dictator in the Bush administration's sights almost from the first moments of the 9-11 attacks, Iraq's Saddam Hussein. The invasion of Iraq was justified by intelligence reports that Saddam was stockpiling nuclear weapons and that he could pass them to the terrorists. Only after Australia joined the invading forces did we discover Iraq's so-called weapons of mass destruction did not exist. And Australia, under your leadership, Mr Howard, was central to the coalition of the willing. Do you accept that? Oh, yes. Obviously, the decision to join the Americans and the British um, in the Iraqi campaign was very controversial. I remain uh, unrepentant, so to speak, about our decision to join it. I know you defend it, and I understand why you defend it, but are you proud of it, given all that you do now know? My answer is that when I look back, the accumulated view of the entire um, American intelligence established late in 2002 that Iraq did have weapons of mass destruction. I understand that, but it, but it ended up being wrong. And that's the hard bit, isn't it? Intelligence can often be wrong. But the, but, but the problem is, still is that if you wait, if you wait for blue perfect proof that something's going to happen, you can have another Pearl Harbor. I think Australians just really didn't understand the reasons why we were partaking in the Iraq war. Was it weapons of mass destruction? Was it to depose Saddam Hussein? Was it because of terrorism? Perhaps the question is, did we go to war with Iraq because of 9-11? Well, deep down, I didn't think Iraq was responsible. I thought, though, that if Iraq did have weapons of mass destruction, there was a real risk that those weapons would be handed to a terrorist organisation. 
And I think that was a pretty legitimate bona fide concern. The lessons of 9-11 were proving hard and costly. Even when Iraq's stockpiles of WMDs proved to be non-existent, the war went on regardless. Now, in two protracted conflicts without real result, America's anger turned inwards. Numerous conspiracy theories emerged, accusing the government of the ultimate inside job. Two events on 9-11 became central to the conspiracy claims. The first was United Airlines Flight 93, the last of the four planes hijacked, supposedly heading for the White House. The aircraft is moving away. Moving away from the White House. Yeah, we, we believe just, we just know it's a VFR aircraft. We're not sure who it is. Uh, uh, as a captain, I would like to all remain seated. We have uh, home aboard and we are going to the airport and we have our demand, so please remain quiet. United 93, you understand, have a bomb on board, go ahead. Executive 956, did you understand that transmission? He affirmative, he said there was a bomb on board. Air traffic control recordings and calls from those on board told of an horrific but doomed attempt by passengers to seize back control of the aircraft before crashing into a field in rural Pennsylvania. Did you hear uh, foot screaming? Yes, I did. But despite all the evidence, Conspiracy theories began to circulate that the jet had been shot down by US forces. Then a second event occurred amidst the devastation of the Twin Towers in New York, when another building that formed part of the World Trade Center complex, known as Tower 7, suddenly and without warning, collapsed hours after the attack. We're gonna roll that tape for you. This is World Trade number seven collapsing just it's 47 floors disintegrated almost in free fall taking less than six seconds conspiracy theorists claim tower seven was brought down deliberately by a controlled demolition an allegation backed by a group of 3400 building professionals called architects and engineers for 9-11 truth the leader of the group is Richard Gage. The truth about 9-11 is a wake-up call for all of us. The explosive evidence and eyewitness testimony reveals to us not only controlled demolition, but a massive false flag operation, a massive series of lies from our government. Well, I spoke to Jonathan Barnett, CEO of Basic Expert and one of the world's leading fire structural engineers. Barnett was an expert witness in the US government's central investigation into the collapse of the Twin Towers and gave evidence to the US Congress. In all the investigations, and you said you looked deliberately, any evidence for a controlled demolition, what would you have needed to have found? We would have looked for um, steel that had been pre-cut. We would have looked for steel that have been damaged in an explosion, which is different than steel that's been damaged from the forces induced by a falling building. We found nothing. And if you'd seen a conspiracy, you would have called it out? Of course we would have. And, and uh, it's, it's something that all of us were strongly dedicated to, finding the truth. Barnett's team also established the complex preparation that would be needed for a controlled demolition in a building like Tower 7. That kind of work doesn't happen in an hour or two. It takes many days, and in some buildings, weeks to do. Well, none of that happened on Tower 7. Yolanda, can I bring you in, in here? Conspiracy theories just abound after 9-11. What happens, what's going on that 
people with high intellects, you know, expertise decide something something fishy is going on. Basically, what a conspiracy theory is, is is an attempt to regain some sense of control. And whenever something big happens, right, like 9-11, but even COVID, so we want to have an explanation about us because our worldview is seriously sort of challenged at that moment. So we saw that with uh, Princess Diana, was it MI5 who killed her? And uh, there are so many conspiracy theories about why JFK, how he was murdered. And the same is actually the case with 9-11. We cannot accept psychologically on that something as big as this was just caused by a handful of terrorists. And by actually embracing the conspiracy theory, we feel that we're back in control. We understand why the world is and why all of, the, why all of this happened the way that it did. You must find this galling, James, to think that people do think this wasn't an attack by an enemy. Yeah, and look, it's, I've, I've obviously heard all the conspiracy theories about that, that building falling down. Uh, to be completely honest, Liz, I'm actually flabbergasted more buildings weren't knocked down. I'm, I'm surprised that anything was left standing within 10 blocks of the joint. I mean, for 20 years now, I've had people that didn't happen. It was an inside job. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm here to tell you that it did happen. While conspiracy theorists muddied the waters, world leaders were struggling to contain a far more divisive backlash against the Muslim community. As our Prime Minister, Mr Howard, spoke to Parliament about the attacks immediately after returning to Australia and said this. And I say to my fellow Australians of Islamic faith or of Middle Eastern descent, I extend to you the hand of friendship. You are part of our great society. You are part of the fabric of the great, decent, freedom-loving, fair-minded Australian nation. And they are as entitled to share my outrage and my sorrow and my anger and my sadness as are others within our community, Mr Speaker. Because wouldn't it be a terrible, tragic, obscene irony if in responding, however we do it as individuals or as nations, in responding to these um, terrible terrorist attacks, we forsook the very things that we believed had been assaulted that last Tuesday in New York. I can sense that it's one of those things that you deeply regret that's come from this, that Muslims have suffered terribly, unnecessarily, as a result. In no way did I want the Muslims of Australia to be made scapegoats for this. And Ali, the backlash, that affected you personally? Very much so. I'm, I'm not visibly Muslim, you know. I don't wear the hijab, but I'd been going to this coffee shop and then one morning after 9-11, I had a necklace on um, and um, someone behind the counter said, oh, are you Muslim? And the barista whom I was on first name terms with heard that and looked at me and said, what do you think about, you know, 9-11 and, and, and innocent people getting killed? I said, well, I, I abhor violence against innocent people everywhere. And he said, good. And then as I was walking out of the coffee shop, he yelled out, look out everybody, she's a Muslim, she's gonna bomb us all. And the whole coffee shop just went silent. It was, it was just shocking. And I went up, sat in the toilet and cried into my coffee cup. That was my response. Well, and it was, it was precisely the intent. They wanna make us afraid of one another. But that was precisely one of the goals of the attacks, was to enrage, it was to bring on this ap apocalyptic, sort of contest. And the, the challenge for the West was to resist that. Yeah. Uh, the challenge for the West was to reach for the higher ground. James, did you have a feeling about who had done this? Did you develop a feeling about Muslims, for example? No, not at all. I grew up in Australia, proud multicultural society. It's very easy to get angry and, and go looking for something to scapegoat. And my, my view has always been to try and rise above that. And, uh, and I think if, that's a very important place to be or else it just, it consumes you. You can't let that happen. Within minutes of the attack on that dreadful morning of September 11th, 2001, 
America as we knew it and our belief in its invincibility crumbled with the Twin Towers. In the New York Minute. Wars followed in Afghanistan and Iraq. But in the US, there remained a sense of unfinished business. The leader of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, had not been dealt with. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. 10 years ago, on May the 2nd, 2011, Osama bin Laden was finally hunted down and killed in Pakistan by SEAL Team 6. A terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. On nights like this one, we can say to those families who have lost loved ones to Al-Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. Tragically, any benefits the coalition forces battled to bring to Afghanistan are being obliterated as we speak. Within days of the withdrawal of US troops, a reinvigorated Taliban had seized control of the capital, Kabul. And the world could only watch and wonder what was achieved as the people of Afghanistan found themselves back where it all began. If you've lived through one, one thing you won't do is fail to imagine the possibility of another. And indeed, it's, it's important to think beyond another 9-11. Among the lessons, the stark warning that for everything that has happened in the 20 years since 9-11, something like that terrible day, according to the experts, will happen again. The Americans know that if terrorists ever get their hands on a nuclear device, they will be the target. And it's important for us to understand that terrorists will use whatever weaponry they can to cause maximum destruction and death. They're chilling words. Mr Howard, what do you think are the lessons we can take from 9-11? I mean, we are, as a nation, united uh, in behind certain values. And that's the most important thing about our country, our common values. And it's the thing that binds us to the United States. But more than anything else, we have the same values. And the values are, are more important than trade, they're more important than economic systems, they're more important than anything else. And we've got to hold on to them very tightly. I find it unfortunate that it led to lots of actions. And regardless of whether they were effective or not in, in uh, sort of the fight against terrorism, it led to a lot of hardship. It didn't really resolve a lot of the problems really in the Middle East. And Ali? Terrorists are opportunists, uh, much like many criminals. They will exploit weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Individuals can be inspired to carry out a terrorist attack with extremely low-tech weapons, a car, a knife. And then we also have the very real prospect of cyber terrorism. So I think that terrorism has changed and the way in which we respond to terrorism also needs to change. I would point out that after 9-11, there hasn't been a 9-11. Uh, and why is that? Um, because the US, using its intelligence tools primarily, made it a very dangerous thing to be, to be a leader of a of global terrorist organisation. There were thousands of victims of 9-11 and many more who have suffered in the 20 years since that terrible morning. The world will never be as it was. But from the ashes of Ground Zero, New York has rebuilt. And so have the many survivors who were there. In one sense, Liz, 20 years seems a long, long time ago to me. But on the other hand, it just feels like yesterday. And for me personally, it probably doesn't fill me with a great deal of joy going back and uh, going through the events of that day and 
But I think at this time it's really important that the story is told because I don't want this to be shots on a television screen. There's a human side to this of which I'm a very small part. And I think um, one of the themes that's washed through today is that everybody has a, a role to play to ensure that these type of things don't happen again in the future. And that is my uh, very firm hope. Well said. Well, thank you all very much for joining us to remember a day that we need to learn from and one the world must never forget. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.